Look, I think it's fair to say that we're going to finish with a bang. Okay, we've got a fantastic speaker with lots of experience uh, for our last session. And I'm sure you're going to take a lot away from, um, from the conversation or, or, or the presentation with uh, Jarmo Kekalainen. Jarmo is a former professional ice hockey player, as I'm sure you well know, playing both in Finland and in the NHL. He's also been a general manager of uh, IFK in Helsinki, but then he also he went back to the, uh, to the US and, uh, and became a player personnel uh, director for the Senators until 2002, then went to the St. Louis Blues, came back to Finland, and then went back to, um, to the NHL, uh, and now he's the general manager of the Columbus Blue Jackets. Okay, so please welcome Jarmo Kekalainen. Thank you very much. Um, it was a great presentation by Tommy. It was actually a good segue to, uh, to my portion of the, uh, of the uh, seminar or symposium. Um, you know, I don't, um, I, I've been at this quite a long time now. As I listen to the introduction, I feel old. But um, you know, uh, I was 29 years old when I got my first manager's job. And that was the first time that in Finland I was a... Uh, a specific hockey manager or director of sports or director of hockey, whatever you want to call it, GM. Uh, I called myself a manager with IFK Helsinki and, and I kind of felt that there was sort of a little bit of a disconnect always between the coaches and the management. And that's sort of been my life's mission as a manager is to get, get coaches and management united together and then also united with the players. And and I'm honored to be here, invited uh, by the coaches uh, to the coaches symposium because I'm the bad guy that has fired coaches before. So I appreciate the invitation. But um, I actually view myself as a coach, believe it or not. I, I, I look at myself as, as my job is, is coaching. I coach the, uh, the coaches and at times I coach the players too. It's on an individual level. I don't like to go to the room to talk to the players much because I think that's basis for the coaches and for the players. But sometimes there, there is a moment that I feel that it, there's a need for me to go there and, and, and send a message or, or strengthen a message or uh, you know, sort of react into the situation developing or, or what we have in hand. So, so sometimes I do that. But I always say to the players that if I, if I come there in the beginning of the season and I don't come there at all except maybe to celebrate at the end of the year, which is the goal, then it's been a great season. So my goal is always to get through the season, just, just open the season with the, uh, with the coaching staff and, and talk to the players. But other than that, I go to the locker room to, uh, to know the players, to get to know them and, and spend time with them and, and show them that we're all in this together. And, uh, and I don't, I don't want to be the guy that's sitting high in the office and... Uh, Ivory Tower and, and, and call the, uh, the general manager or the boss. I actually have one rule for my staff. You can't call me the boss. That's my only rule because I have a name and, and I want to show that we're in this together. So don't call me the boss. That aggravates the shit out of me. So I don't have much of a uh, PowerPoint. I'm, I'm not a tech savvy guy, but uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the leadership and, and uh, how we do it as a team. And then in the other section, I'm going to talk about the framework that I use with the coaching staff when I work with them together and, and together with the players. So um, I think it all starts with, with the... Uh, hold on. It all starts with the right people. So I want to work with the people that I can trust. I want to work with people that I know that are competent, that do the work. But first and foremost, I want to work pe with people that I can trust. And that's something that you're going to hear throughout my, my time here. That there's two words. You know, uh, Tommy had some great um, you know, background and research for his, his uh, coaching theories, and I appreciate that. I've actually read every book that he had there. And I'm going to add one to that. It's called Captain Class. That's something that I introduced to our team and our leaders, and that's something that I think we can all learn from a lot. Um, but trust and respect. We talked about group dynamics. We talk about team spirit. We talk about all the fancy words, all we want. 
But I think if we want to simplify it, it comes down to two words, trust and respect. I want to trust the people that I work with and because I trust them, I know that they come to work every day to do the best they can, I'll respect them too. And I expect the same both ways. I don't want any yes men around me. I don't want people that, that tell me that how great I am or how good I am or how good the decisions are that we're making together. I want people to challenge me. That, that sometimes can, even gets uncomfortable, but, but it, it's good for all of us. I want individual thinkers, but I also want people that at the end of the day, when we agree on something, then we go out and we agree. I've said this, I, I, don't, I don't make a lot of threats uh, with people because I don't believe in that. I don't think it's a good motivating thing. But the quickest way out of our organization is talking bad about our organization outside of it. You can come to my office and challenge me on anything and we'll have tough discussions and sometimes we won't agree and sometimes we'll even have a few FU fights. I had a few with John Tortorella. <laughs> and, uh, but at the end of the day, we always agreed. And I could always trust him that whatever we agreed on, he, he was great to work with. I really appreciated his honesty. You always knew where you st stood with him, both the players and, and the management. There was never any bullshit behind anybody's back. That's important. I, I'm a big believer in letting people, people grow. You know, you grow by, by giving them more responsibility or af after you earn it, you give them more responsibility. Actually, one of the biggest joys I have uh, in my career and, and that I take a lot of pride in is that uh, people have grown working with me and hopefully they've taken something from me that they, they can use in their, in their future jobs. Uh, I was uh, with great pride that two, two guys that I hired for their first uh, NHL jobs, got uh, general manager's job in the last couple of years, Bill Zito in uh, Florida and Bill Armstrong in, in um, Arizona, and, and I'm very proud of that. And, and when you trust and respect somebody, then you let them do, your, do their work. You don't interfere. I don't ever look over the shoulder of Tim Leroy, our equipment manager, and teach him how to sharpen skates. I don't go into the uh, physical therapist's room and start telling them what to do. If I trust them and I respect them, and that's why I've chosen them to do the work they do, the role they do, then I let them do their work. I, I, I think it's really important. And one thing that I, that I took from Tommy's um, presentation that, that we're very, very uh, adamant about is that it's always about we. There's no me or I. I hate it when people say that. Sometimes you get credit, sometimes you get shit for drafting somebody and somebody good or somebody bad. And, and they say, well, the general manager drafted that player. Well, I didn't draft anybody. The Blue Jackets drafted him. And it's, it's, it should be about we. Whatever we do, it's always we. It's our team, it's our players, our training camp, our decision, our mistake, our success, and our failure. I told Tommy, I don't know how he got through his presentation without taking a sip of water, but he's a pro. So, um, after you get your staff together, you get the people, you get the right people that you can trust and you can respect, I think it all starts by nailing down the values of, of the organization. Something that you can all agree on, something that you can all commit to, something you can all live by every day, together. And I think the biggest thing with us, because we're, we're, we're in the um, hockey business and we, we want talented people, we always talk about talent and, and annoys the hell out of me. Just, this is, again, very similar to what Tommy said, but it annoys the hell out of me when I listen to, in junior games, somebody say, well, that, that guy was born with it. That guy was, had it from, got it from his, his uh, mother nursing him. That's, that's how talented he is. Well, that's, that doesn't happen that way. So. We want to define the talent differently. We, we don't look at just skills and, and uh, you know, that's the easiest part of player evaluation is, is seeing who can skate, who can shoot the puck, who can, 
who's got the good phys physical attributes. That's really easy. So we want to define talent as in, as in we value character and, and heart and attitude as talent. That's, that's the most important part of it. It's not just the physical tools. And it's, it, it applies to every job, every role on our team, not just on the ice, but off the ice as well. You know, we're, we're in the performance business where we're, when the game time, you got to be able to do the job. And, and, and the brighter the lights, the, the bigger the attention, people talk about pressure. And it, it is real. And, and you have to be able to perform when, when the pressure is at its highest and, and the um, expectations are high. But, but, you know, the relaxed intensity, I call it. Can, can you perform under pressure? And are you poised? to do that when, when, when it counts the most. And that's, that's talent. The one big thing that we always talk about with, with players is that uh, don't be afraid of making a mistake. I try to make it, make it a habit of whenever we have a player that is going to play his first NHL game, I'm going to go to him. Just I'm not going to invite him to my office for a meeting to make him more nervous or anything like that. But I try to bump into him at lunch or or in the locker room and say, hey, just one thing, you know, you're on your way here, just enjoy it. It's great. It's, 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 it's a dream for you and it's coming true here, but just remember one thing, don't be afraid of making a mistake. We value passion. There's a lot of hurdles in our business that we have to get through, the expectations, the fans, the sponsors, the money, the winning. And, and, and I think that, that um, you know, the managers are probably at fault a little bit of, of creating that culture or we're in the business of winning. And I, I totally agree with, with uh, Tommy that I think we should be in the business of improving. That's, that's, that's something that I... We'll definitely take from him his presentation something we believe in too and, and, and have preached the whole time. But if you have the passion for the game, it'll get you through all the uh, physical hurdles that a lot of the players have, but also the staff, the travel and on the schedules and all that. It's it's not as easy as it as it seems a lot of times. And it's not all about just glory in, in the NHL either. It's it's a lot of hard work and and you need that passion, that genuine passion to get through it. Um, it's not just the physical either. It's it's the mental and and the uh, the emotional hurdles that you have to get through because it's going to be ups and downs and 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 nobody can avoid that. We value teammates that possess the right blend of motives. You know, Tommy went through that as well. It's it's a lot. Of some players, it's it's you know. I think you need a certain level of selfishness too. I think it drives you to be better. But once it gets to the wrong side of that and it starts sucking the energy out of the team. So we we got to we got to make sure that that uh, we value teammates that have have the right blend of motives. It should be if it's strong it should be about loving the game. Why do you play hockey? You got to love the game. Same in coaching, same in in any job that we have around the team. You got to love the game. You got to have that passion to and, and the, the motive in, in that center of your blend of motives, there has to be the uh, love of the game. And you also have to love winning because it, it, it's a big price that you have to pay to get there to that top that Susanna Rakamo was talking about. It's, it's, it's not an easy road. So you've got to love winning. In team sports, we've got to understand that we can only win as a team. And, and so... Do you have the right level of selfishness? But not, but also, are you unselfish and are you loyal and honest to the team? And I would talk about work ethic a lot. Obviously, that's a that's a word that gets thrown around all the time. I I try to talk more about pride and and uh, or professional pride because the um, work ethic it gets tested in your own professional pride and it's getting tested nowhere else but the mirror. And if you do that every day and you stay honest to yourself and, and, and test your professional pride and, and um, work ethic in your own mirror regularly enough, you know exactly where you're at. You can't cheat the guy in the mirror. 
we value manners. I think it's really important in team sports that, uh, that we have the right kind of manners and that this is where the respect factor comes in. You can be hard on a teammate. If, if you have that professional pride and you, uh, you know that you've looked in the mirror and you come to the rink every day and you, you do the absolute best and you're honest to yourself, you can demand that from, from a teammate. But you've got to do it the right way. You don't have to be disrespectful. You don't have to hurt anybody's feelings. You don't have to be mean. But that's an art itself, and, and that's, that's something that we take very seriously, and that's something we demand from everybody on our team, that we value manners. We want people to treat each other with respect, and we're very, very careful with that with, when we see something that doesn't sit right. Dare to be proud. I think it's important, especially for us Finns, and uh, it's you know the genuine pride and is is uh, is good. That that's it, you shouldn't be afraid to say, hey, I'm good at what I do. There's a big difference in being cocky and arrogant, because usually, if you're cocky and arrogant, you haven't done much. That's why you have to be cocky and arrogant. So, genuine pride. There to show it. We dream big. That's that's the one thing that we talk about. We talk about it out, out openly. That hey, we want to win the cup. And don't be afraid to say it. Don't be afraid to dream it. But you know, we also got to live up to these values every day to get there. When when we have all these things around us, see, like I mentioned, sponsors and and. Um, Owners and, and our business and, and media, social media, all, all all these different things that are around the team. And I call it distraction sometimes, but it's something that we have to deal with too. It's 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 something that's without those elements, we wouldn't have the game the way it is right now, and we wouldn't have the jobs we have. And and uh, so it's really important that we have have a unified group that nothing can get in between our, our group and when we, the, how, the way we work and the way we do things. People will try, media will try, fans will try, but we have to stay, stay strong. There's no weaknesses in, in our group. That's really important. They'll, all, they'll always try, they'll poke you and they'll try to get a response out of you and, and get you to go against the manager or maybe a there's a rift between the coach and the player, and they try to exploit that in the media. It's got to be a unified message and a unified group. One thing that I, th I think is really important is that the players cannot detour the coach to a manager, and vice versa. So if, if a player comes to me thinking that he can throw the coach under the bus, it'll never happen. The coach will know. And, and, and the same thing, if, I, if I'm going to go talk to a player and I have a message for the player, we're going to be on the same page with the coach. So it's, it's going to be out in the open. When we're unified, I think the cohesion provides inspiration for the players. They know that the ship's being built and navigated the right way and, and with professionalism and they're, they're in this together and they're here to help us. You know, when the players realize that we're, we're actually thinking of their best and they start trusting us and respecting us the way we do things, it's, it's the start of a good thing. They can, they, they can actually take a lot of energy and, 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 um, and confidence from us if, if we uh, navigate the ship the right way. It's always going to be doubters, though, so you got to be... Got to be careful there too, so not not to let that seep into the team and and um, you know, react to it because that's human nature, which leads me to conflict and problem solving. You can't avoid conflict; it's it's going to happen. There's 20, 25 different individuals on team, so there's going to be different agendas. There's going to be Sometimes that selfishness is going to seep in and, and get to a level where it, it needs the coaches or the managers to react to it, and, 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 and we got to stay strong on that. So conflict will happen. It's how we deal with it that will define our group. 
And as I mentioned earlier, it, it, can, be, it can be hard meetings. We can be staring at each other for a long time in that room, but, but we'll, we'll talk, we'll communicate, we'll go through things. And once we come out of there, well, then, then we will agree. Otherwise, we'll stay in that room for a long time. But there's so much in our environment, especially with on the, on the highest level, where there's so much attention on players on individual level and as a team and coaches, the pressure that, that it's real, really important to stay unified. And when conflict happens, that you attack it immediately. Which leads me to, to media, which is something that, again, is, I mean, sometimes we view it as the enemy because they write bad things about us and then we're real happy when they write a positive story and, and, and it's, it's a roller coaster. I've, I can assure you that I've, I've got a lot of clips that, that I could show here that uh, both that I'm, I'm an idiot and then I'm a genius and something in between in the. Uh, since 1995 that I've been in the management, but I think I've learned uh, over the years to um, sort of you know, respect what they do because they have a job to be done, and, 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 but it's not going to affect my thinking or our thinking and the way we do business. But as coaches and management, I think we always have to take in consideration what we say and how we say it, when we say it in the media because players are listening, everybody's listening all the time, they're paying attention to every word, every, and not just the words, but the body language as well. So, you know, you, you can have your personality, you don't, you don't need to have your, uh, you don't need to be a robot and go in front of media and say the, uh, the old cliches, and that. I don't mean that at all. It's good that we have personalities, but at the same time, I think you need to be sort of like a poised businessman when, when you go in front of the media and, and, and talk, about, talk about things knowing and keep it in mind always that, that uh, you got to have the organization's best in, in, in the back of your mind and ne never let that slip. We need to sell the game. We, we need to... Um, that's how we improve to, on the ice too. If we sell the game, and if if we uh, if this great games gets to more countries and more people, more guys, more boys, more girls play this game, the better it's going to be. So we got to keep that in mind as well. It's the passion. Passion in front of Mini is fine, but but we don't need a sideshow. I I think that Tommy nailed it on that one too when he talked about players being the show, and they they deserve the show. They're the performance. Performers and, and they should be the performers and, and, and as managers and coaches, we don't need to be the sideshow. Sometimes when it happens, you know, we'll stay together and then we'll, we'll have your back. You know, we're all human beings. We make mistakes and sometimes there could be a slip up. And, and uh, trust me, with again, with, with a, a great coach, John Tortorella, we had a lot of good meetings after his his uh, media interactions, but I think he got a lot better as, as, the, uh, as, as the relationship went on. Understand your players individually. Tommy talked about that a little bit as well. You know, I, I think it's really important you get to know them as people, and it starts again by building that trust and building the respect little by little. Those two things, are, they go hand in hand, but they're kind of funny in a way where you can't rush them. You can't ask for, for trust and respect. You can't demand trust or respect. It happens when you earn it. And with everybody, it happens in a different uh, timetable. There are some people that click right away and they trust and respect each other very quickly. And then there's going to be, there's going to be somebody that's going to take a long time before they're going to trust you and, and respect you enough to have that, have that type of relationship where they actually open up and, and, and tell you about themselves. You know, the um, strengths and weaknesses and fears, what, what ignites the player, we get back to that uh, mo motive cocktail again and, and understanding that what drives that player is, is so important both on the, on the coaching level and the management level so that we can feed him the right stuff to, to get the best out of him and help him, help him be the best he can be. 
sometimes it's rewards, sometimes it's it's uh, recognition, sometimes it's just letting him be and and enjoy the game. And and some people hate the recognition and uh, in front of the group in particular. But we got to recognize where, where he's at with that motive cocktail of, of his. And sometimes it goes this way, sometimes it goes that way. But if we know the player inside and out, we know which way it's going and we can react to it. It's our responsibility with, with the players to, to put them in a place where they can succeed. And, and if, you, if you know your, your individuals thoroughly, not just what they do on the ice or in, in their work off the ice, but as individuals, as people, then, then you have a much better chance of putting them in, into a situation where they can succeed, succeed. That's our responsibility. If we put them into a situation where they're not ready and they fail, it's on us. Then understanding your players collectively too, what the team dynamic is. Do you, do you know who the, uh, the clown is, who the leader is? There may be a guy that's a leader, but, but a reluctant one doesn't want to get in front of anybody and talk about his leadership. It just does it by example, quietly, and, and it's awkward for him if, if he uh, is dragged in front of the group. What, what does the group res respond to? What do they ignore? And in team sports, there's a lot, a lot of talk about you know, treating everybody fairly equally that's that's one thing you know t people talk about team sports and they say well every player on this team is equally important i think that's that's bullshit it's just not true and, and i try to avoid that or i never say that to a group of guys because we know that the guys that that carry the most responsibility they they have the, the biggest ice time, they have their bigger roles, and they have their bigger pay for a reason. But instead, we can always say that every player on our team is very important. And without, without everybody, we, we, we will not win, and we will not get to where we want to go. The one thing that I've noticed is uh, realizing that the players sometimes might have different leaders, what coaches and managers think uh, uh, are the leaders. We, we have our picture in mind of, of, of the uh, polished talker and, and the guy that says the right things and, and does the right things, but players might see it differently sometimes. The, the, that's one thing that's so great about hockey locker room is that those guys are in a small room every day for eight months of the year, staring at each other in the eyes. They keep each other accountable. The great rooms are, are very good at that, so you can't, can't escape that stare from the, from the leaders, but um, sometimes the players have different leaders than, than what we think. And again, I think this, I'm repeating the dare to be proud, but I, 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 I feel that that's something that's, especially being a Finn, uh, that, you know, and I've, I've seen, uh, Seen a lot, a lot of Finnish players come and go from from North America, and and guys that could be uh, could be leaders and should be leaders, but but uh, you know it, it's a different culture, obviously, over there. And and Tom Pere has the best best example of of one of the best players that ever played on the international level. Anyway, Raipa Heleminen is is a uh, is a picture of the uh, modesty, if, if you want to call it that. He would he would. Never say and that I'm I'm great, but but I think inside he always knew that he was great, just like Barkov was the was the other example. But but um, I think it's good, and I think it'd be good for our development, especially as Finns, to to just dare to be proud. Again, these two words: trust and respect. You know, uh, when when we hire people, um, we let them do their job. Micromanaging is is a terrible thing, and um, uh, and I I don't think it works anyway. So I mean, it just shouldn't be done in in the first place. You know, the the 
people get hired because they're good at what they do and and so we should support them and, and nurture them and and learn from them and the one thing that that i i run into with with coaches a lot is that uh, that actually annoys me quite a bit is that you know coach the team that you have in that role don't don't talk about we need this or we need that I, i'll have that conversation with the head coach on, on how we can get better and we talk about different players that or different type of players that we may need and those those discussions are ongoing and every day but if i hear the coach talking about well we can't be good because we don't have this and we need another defenseman or we need another four we our, our power play can't be good because we don't have the guys that can play power play. Oh, what, do, what do you think the players are going to think in the locker room if, if you go out in public and say that. It's a terrible message to send to the room. So I, I think that should be something that you have to be real careful about when, when talking outside the organization in particular and, and in the media. Now, the one thing that, that I take very seriously is, is um, Try, trying to stick to telling people how this is possible, how we can do this together, rather than telling them why it's, it's not possible. People don't, don't want to hear that. They want to hear how it's possible. Our mission as coaches and managers should be that what can we do today to make players on individual level better and, and as a result, our team better. Details. We, a lot of times we take, take things for granted. You know, I, I believe in checking and double checking on ev every little detail so that the players can just concentrate on playing and there's no excuses. They're, they're great at playing so they shouldn't have to worry about anything else. But I'll give you one funny example of when I, I was a manager of Jokerit before I went to Columbus and we had a uh, seasoned pro by the name of Ilari Filppula, who was well, probably 30 years old at the time, and played pro hockey and won the championship in Finland and was a very good player. And he kept going into the offensive zone where, where he would take the puck across the blue line before going over the blue line and would cause offside all the time. I'm like, what the hell is he doing? Does he not know the offside rule? You have to get over the line before you can use the line. I'm going to go ask him. So I went and asked him. He did not know the offside rule. He thought he can take the puck across the blue line before going over the blue line. I think it's a perfect example that I use with our staff all the time. Don't take anything for granted. you got to double check, check, double check. Make sure that that, that information is, is repeated enough so that don't, don't take it for granted. If that can happen... Anything can happen. Being organized is being proof that, that you're prepared. I think that's, that's what checking details is all about and checking them over and over again. And you can check them and be, be aware of all the little details, but you don't have to stick your fingers into everything. And that's, again, we'll get into that micromanagement. Control mechanisms. The biggest one is obviously the uh, the ice time or the role that you have have on our team. That's that's how you'll get everybody to listen on the team when you when you take ice time away or or give a little bit more of it. Same thing with responsibility and and, and growth within our staff. One thing that I take really seriously is, is making sure that everybody knows what's expected of them. That's, that's again, going back into the uh, check-in, double-check-in to make sure that we have very clear understanding that this is what's expected of you, this is why you're here, this is your role, and um, this is how we're going to do it together. We're always trying to keep in mind, and I have two, two girls, teenagers, gets hotter with, with them that I 
try to apply the same principle at home that try try to notice something good rather than than something to be corrected all the time I think it's really important for both coaches and managers to know the room, to have, have that finger on the pulse, uh, to, to know the temperature of the room. And sometimes you have to put a little more heat in there and sometimes you have to cool it down a bit. And, and um, that comes again from knowing the individuals and knowing the, knowing the group as a whole and, and the dynamics of, of your groups. And sometimes in today's world, and, and this is the, the, I guess, the business and the ego side of it is that... that, that you know, um, and I, I think it's the growth of, of today's player too. They they want to know why, and, and and they don't they don't respond well to okay. Here's what you're gonna do, and you're gonna like it. So sometimes you have to negotiate with them a little bit. Okay, how about you meet me halfway? I'll give you this, and if you give me this, and we'll meet halfway, and we'll go from there, and we'll improve together. I, I think it works for coaches and management at the same time. Black and white, it doesn't work as well anymore as, as it may have, although um, I don't think it's ever worked that well. We just thought that it worked well because we weren't, we, we weren't um, far enough in that process of improving that we're trying to do here every day, like Tommy said. Earn, earning that trust... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, an authority as a manager or as a coach. You know, the, again, there's there's no shortcuts. Can't ask for it. Can't can't push it. Can't demand it. Starts by by uh, being demanding to yourself, to to earn that trust from from everybody around you. I don't believe in in belittling anybody. You know, talk talking down on on somebody that that doesn't belong in in any group and and. Not not in hockey, either. I I um, I think having contact regularly. You know, Tommy talked about seventeen hundred and thirty six meetings, was it? Well, something like that. Um, and as he said, it doesn't have to be a meeting in the room. It's the same thing. Sometimes it can be just a nod and saying you notice something real good in practice or notice something in in the games and and uh, just just having a little pat in the back and and. That's just as efficient and, and uh, as as a um, formal meeting of sitting down and talking about things. But that contact that you, you acknowledge them and what they're doing and, and um, notice what they're doing regularly every day. That's that's important. The old cliche. I think I think you know in today's world we have so much information. We have we have analytics. We have video from every angle you can possibly imagine. We have. All these different tools and information overflow. Um, I, I think it's really important to to, to remember the old cliche that uh, before they care how much you know, they have to know how much you care. And and you know it's an old one, but it's a good one. And you have to show them by by your actions, not just by your words. The. Um, the nonverbal communication as a coach it can never be un underestimated. Um, it's it's just as clear as words. And when and you know you watch the World Championships, you watch the NHL or the Finnish League, the can there's one camera on the head coach all the time. So so the uh, now they have it in the manager's box in the NHL too, which is not great, but but um, it, it it's important. And I'm going to go back to uh, my old friend again with an example. We, me and John Tortorella, we had a meeting one time, and, and he was real adamant about body language. He was always talking about body language. And, and I have a ton of respect for him. He's, he's a good friend to today, and, and we're going to be friends for life. But you know, he's always talking about body language and body language. So I, one time we were having a meeting, and I said, Tort, just recently, who's had the worst body language on our team? And he looked at me and said, I don't know. I said, you. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, my wife's been telling me the same thing. The camera's been on me all the time. And said, well, I don't know why it's on you, because they know. But, but it was great. He admitted it. And, and, um, but, you know, guys are looking at the big screen, and coach is going, oh, man, that guy. 
the guys were joking about it after the season. They were saying that Tor Torts is talking behind the bench saying, oh, that guy did this and that guy did that. And the guy's like, I'm here, I'm right here, Torts. Talk to me. But it's the body language is so, so important. And you got to be so careful with it. I think I skipped one, but I already talked about it. So now you can see I'm not great at PowerPoint. Um, I, I think that that um, you know Tom told me again. I, I really enjoyed his presentation. He talked about the same thing and let let the guys take over. When you have the right kind of leadership in the room and you know they're doing the right things and 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 you can trust them. You respect them. They come to work. They they do it every single day. And 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 the standard. Is what I talk about a lot in in um, in hockey is that you have to have that daily standard that never slips, and and the great coaches they all have that they they have that standard that there's even if it's a bad day the slip from the the standard is very small, and then you know it can it can be a little bit better great but it's never going to slip, and and I think the good coaches let the uh, the leaders take over, and good managers. Let the leaders take over, and, and, and when things go great, step step back. Take two steps back. I talked to Oli Jokinen before uh, he started his coaching career here in the Finnish league. The only advice I gave him, because he's seen a lot of hockey and, and been around the hockey world for a long time, and I really admire his passion to come to uh, Finland and change his lifestyle the way he did and go, go to Mikkeli and coach that talks to me about tells me a story of passion and, and wanting to be a hockey coach. But the only, only advice I gave him when we talked before the season was that, uh, you know, when things go good, step in the back, take two steps back. If things get shitty and, and, and you have adversity and you struggle, that's when you step in the front. As managers, I, I think it's really important that you let the uh, coaches coach. I don't ever go to the coach and say, you have to play this player. I've done it a couple times, the coaches, where I've gone to negotiate, that would you consider not, not scratching this player? We had a uh, first round pick by the name of Pierre-Luc Dubois, and he struggled first, first year, and, and he was a sensitive guy. And um, he, Torts was going to healthy scratch him, and, and, and I went the only time that I've really gone to the head coach's office in my nine years to to really negotiate with strong persuasion that uh, don't don't scratch him, please don't scratch him, and uh, here's why, and here's here's my thought process, and this is this is what I think will happen if you do, and here's here's what I think will happen if you don't. And he didn't, so we agreed again on on, um, on something that we disagreed before the meeting, and and um, he put him at center and played him on the first line with Panarin, and he took off his career, took off from there, and I and I'm not saying at all that that was something that I accomplished, but but I really believe that um, you got to let the coaches make those decisions. That's. They they know the pulse of the room better than anybody else, so they got to have that responsibility. They got to have that opportunity and uh, to uh, to coach the way they want to do do it. And we have to, as managers, we have to support their decisions. And and when we ask questions, do that in in uh, in a positive manner. A little bit of a repetition here, the clear communication. You know, it's not always what you say, it's what you don't say, the body language again, and, and who you say it to, and, and, and you gotta always, always think of what the player's gonna hear rather than just what you're gonna say. Because what they hear is even more important. Players will listen better if they know that we listen to them. That's That's one very, Simple principle that I believe in that unless we respect them and listen to them and they're not going to respect us It's going to be very hard for them to uh, to learn from us or follow us 
as leaders if if we don't respect them, if we don't listen to them. I don't be, I don't believe in talking about uh, things and leaving gray areas. I've had a I've had some good friends that have you know, talked to me several times about, you know, there's a coach's opening and, and, and on our minor league team, and and, um, and I get a, co a friend of mine who's a good coach call me and, and uh, you know, he, he wants to be the coach, and he's, he's a good coach, has had a great career, but I just didn't think that would be the right, right guy for the job with, uh, with our organization. I'm not going to tell him. I can't look in the mirror if I tell him, yeah, you know what, you're, you're in the final three and, you know, you're a good coach. Because you know, I, I didn't even consider him. I'm going to tell him, you know, I'm not going to hire you. I'm not going to hire you as a coach. There's no gray area. There's no false hope. There's no... I, I think at the end of the day, later on, they're going to appreciate that a lot more than you dragging them on, thinking that they have a chance when at the end of the day they, they didn't even have a chance. I'm going to finish by, by saying that I think it's really important that you display that passion, both, both for us co uh, as, as managers and, and, and coaches, that, that uh, you know, we really truly uh, communicate to our environment that we love the game and, and we're ready to do whatever it takes to win and we're ready to help each other in any, any way to, to uh, get through the uh, physical and emotional hurdles to, to win. And... and uh, you know, that's the passion is the one thing that you can't fake. So, you know, if, if you're in hockey for the wrong reasons, you, you're not going to last very long. That's that's one thing that I that I truly believe in. And um, but, you know, I always say I have such appreciation for coaches because it, it's 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 truly a, a job of passion. You have to have the calling for it. I compare it to uh, teachers a lot of times. You know, you're not going to be an elementary school teacher or teach difficult teenagers if, if you don't have the passion to teach people and make them better, better human beings and better citizens. So it's, it's our job to, to um, show that passion and lead everybody and get everybody together to get the best out of them and lead them to a better future. Thank you. Thanks, Yama. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great stuff. Um, woof. Um, a lot to think about there, and um, and as a as a coach, but now thinking as a as an academic that does research into coaching, one of the things that I complain a lot is that we don't get enough first-hand accounts of what doing a job like Yarmos looks like on, in the real world. You know, we write this incredibly lengthy papers with very long words that no one ever reads because they don't mean anything to people. But the, uh, you know, the account that we got from, from Yarmo about the day-to-day -day work um, is, is really important. So one question for you, Yarmo, before, before we open to, to the guys here. You said that for you, the most important thing is to have the right people in the organization. Okay? And one of the books that... Um, came on the screen before with Tommy was the, uh, the Legacy, the All Blacks book. And the All Blacks, um, they have that r rule, and excuse my language here, the uh, no dickheads in the, in the organization, okay? No bad people. How do you go about selecting people? Do you have a bullshit o meter built in that allows you to weed out the bad people? Or how, what processes do you have to make sure that you're hiring the right people? Well, that, that's the hardest part of player evaluation and evaluation in general when you select the people that you want to work with is, is truly get to know their character because it takes time. And this is something that we talk about with our scouts because when we go and watch the game, it's easy to see who can skate and who can pass the puck. But, but to really get to know the character, the competitiveness, the heart of the player, you have to watch him again and again and again. And then you have to interact with him see how he treats other people, how, how he takes into consideration a, a waitress in a, in a restaurant, all kinds of different inter interactions. Talk to their teachers, talk to the, um, the physical therapist of their junior team to, to see how they treat other people on their team. But it, it is hard. But at the same time, I, I think we also have to have a principle that if we have dickheads, uh, excuse my language, on our team, we still have to coach them and we have to manage them. We have to try to make them better. 
and then if it, if it comes to a point where it's a waste of energy for the organization, then we have to get rid of them. Yeah. Um, um, and you do the same with staff, with personnel, uh, with, with, I don't know, your, your coaches, your strength and conditioning coaches, is it the same process? Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, you know, I have, I have a lot of people working with me that, that uh, I've recognized over the years to be that kind of people. Uh, Jarko Ruud, who works for us as a development coach, Nicholas Backstrom, I was a manager of IFK, they both played for IFK at the time, and I recognized even back then that they're, they're special people. Not, not just good hockey players, but, but they're, they're just good, good people. And, and um, you know, th those are two great examples. Ville Siren is one of my best friends, and, and I've known him since 1985. He's a head of our amateur scouting. I don't ever have to worry about amateur scouting. I know that he's going to do the absolute best every single day. And if he's going to make a mistake, it's going to be an honest mistake that everybody makes. We all make mistakes, but it's not going to be for lack of work or, uh, you know, lack of detail or, or, you know, not feeling like it or, you know, any of those type of things. He's always going to work his ass off and, and be very detailed, very thorough. And then he's going to make that decision and, and you know, if mistakes happen, but, but I know I can count on him yeah. and his character. Excellent. Thank you. So, uh, over to you. Any questions from, from the floor here? Oh, here we go. Down there, please. Thank you. Hi, it's Chaba Kovac from, from Hungary. And my question is, if, if you have any issues in the organization during the season, how do you manage that? How do you give heads up to your colleagues, to the players, and how many times you do that? Or how do you manage the issues during the season? Thanks. Well, I guess it depends on what type of issue it is, but um, you know, I, 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 I'm a big believer in clear communication. When, when there's a thing that, if, if there's a conflict, if there's an issue with the team, I'm not going to let it simmer and think it's going to get better on its own. I'm going to raise the issue on the, on the table with, together with everybody and, and we're going to talk about it. So you know, I even have this principle that the harder the issue, the, the kind of, you know, if it's a delicate issue or it seems hard or seems awkward to talk about it, that's when you really need to talk about it. So attack the issue head on right away and don't let it simmer, don't let it grow somewhere because you didn't want to deal with an awkward situation. There's a fantastic book called uh, Difficult Conversations that I would really recommend you to read if you haven't. Uh, I, I can't remember the author right now, but it's a great book about those difficult conversations. Okay, any, any other questions, please? It's the last presentation everybody wants I know, wants hey, but I was going to say, I've, I've been to pff, hundreds of conferences here, okay? We have more people here at the end of the conference than we had at the beginning. Okay, so well That's done good. to you and well done to all these guys, okay? Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask, ask you one more question because I've been meaning to ask this question to all the three speakers this afternoon, right? I never got to it. But all of you spoke about the importance of having that mentality of team first and doing whatever it takes for the team. Now, within that mentality of putting the team first, how do we allow individuals to shine and express their individual talent within the context of the team identity. How is that? How do you do that? I, I think that's really important coming from management and coaching staff that there's a clear framework of, okay, this, this is the framework. We have to express our individualism within these frames, and not, but not suffocating um, the individuals. I had a, uh, a real good talk at the end of the year with some of our star players that are, um, you know, co coaches can probably relate to this, uh, turning the puck over a little bit too much for our taste. And so I asked them a question that I, I think the biggest question to answer for, for, for you in, in the off season, thinking about it and then going into the next seasons is that what do I need to do in this situation to win the game? Not what do I need to do to score the next goal? That's a big difference. If we're up 3-2, it's not a time to express individualism and try to beat three guys on the, on the offensive blue line. 
but if we're down by a goal, you know, and and not a lot of time left, that could be could be the perfect opportunity. But what do you need to do to win the game? Versus what do you need to do to score the next goal? And you got to be careful because those guys are so good because they're so driven to score the next goal. That's that's their passion. They want to score. They want to create offense, and that's how they've become so good at what they do. You don't want to take that away. You don't want to take that passion away. But at the same time, we're in a team sport. We want to win as a team. So you can't can't be driven by this when we actually need this. Such a fine line there yeah. between expressing your your ability, putting that ability at the service of the team. Okay. Well, look, guys, um, it's been an amazing, amazing presentation to, to wrap up the conference. Okay, so please, please thank Yarmo for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you.